come out ready. We'll go ahead and get started here in a little bit. It's 1201, so we'll give everybody a minute or two. I'm going to look at the slides. I don't know. <laughs> And just a reminder to everyone who's joining us now, if you could please, I see most people are, please mute yourself and turn off um, your video. Um, and I can do that for folks as well. I think we can go ahead and start with the intro, Emily. Sounds good. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Emily Green, and I work with the Colorado River Alliance. I'm so excited that everybody is here today for this wonderful presentation um, with our installment of the River Reflection series. Um, so before we get started, I just want to go over some quick information. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we are the Colorado River Alliance, and our mission is to champion the long-term vitality of the Texas Colorado River through education and engagement. And this is an installment of our River Reflection Series, which is our ongoing speaker series, which features all sorts of great stuff. And I'm super excited that Dr. Garza is here to talk to us today. Um, so just as Katie said, as a reminder, make sure that you are muted and that you have your video off. It just helps things run a little bit more smoothly. And then if you have any questions, comment, um, please feel free to uh, put that in the chat. And time permitting, we will have some question and answer at the end of the presentation. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and let Dr. Garza take it away. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, our greeting is uh, uh, Amanam, which means it is good. And the response to Amanam is Yomanam, which means all is good. Uh, I'm going to be doing a presentation on our creation story and how it relates to the White Shaman panel because it, that's how we relate to our four sacred water sites and how that relates to the river or water in general. Okay, um, we have a nonprofit called the Indigenous Cultures Institute and our mission is to preserve the culture of Native Americans, indigenous to Texas and Northern Mexico and to maintain our covenant with our sacred sites. We have uh, 12 programs, and uh, I'm not going to go through them because they'll take too much time, but uh, we have 12 programs, okay, and uh, well, well Tecan is the name given by ethnologists and linguistics to a large number of minor tribes and bands on both sides of the Rio Grande. Some sources say 200, around 200 tribes, some of them say around 500, but uh, with a large number of, of minor tribes that were collectively given the name of Powhultecan, because there was, even though all the tribes had their own language, they had a common commerce language to communicate with each other, and linguistics called that language the uh, Powhultecan language, so they collectively called all of us Powhultecan Indians, even though there was never a Quavotecan tribe or a Quavotecan nation. Okay, there's a myth that the Quavotecans or Quavotecos were absorbed into the Spanish population and that we lost all of our culture. Uh, but that's not true. We have maintained uh, 
a lot of most of our ceremonies uh, we uh, pray in our in the Tekan language and we um, and we maintain a lot of the, of the culture in this uh, map of the bottom of Texas you can see in uh, in red the name of uh, the Tekan tribes that were in that area you can see the, the uh, up there on San Marcos, the main tribe there was the Sana tribe, and then below that you see the Payaya, which was the um, the major tribe in San Antonio, and that's the one that gave the name Yanawana to San Antonio. So a lot of our people refer to San Antonio as Yanawana. Okay. Uh, early non-indigenous settlement in San Marcos. Uh, in January 1808, a small group of Mexican families established a settlement via the San Marcos de Nave. And that's when the present city of San Marcos was established. Then uh, two years later, in, in November 1846, the first Anglos settled in San Marcos and they moved a lot of the uh, Mexican families out and also a lot and started moving some of the Indians out. And then in March, 1848, the Texas legislature organized his county and designated San Marcos as the county seat. The county was named Hayes after uh, a Texas Ranger by the name of Jack Coffee Hayes and you see a monument of, of Jack Coffee Hayes, and he was credited to uh, killing a lot of Indians in the area and, and moving the Indians out. Okay, hostilities towards indigenous people. The Texas Rangers were founded in 1823 by Stephen F. Austin. And if you read the history books, it said that Texas Rangers were established to protect Anglo settlers from Mexicans and Indians. But actually, the real reason to establish the Texas Rangers was to kill Mexicans and Indians. The second president of the Republic of Texas, Mirabeau B. Lamar, and you can find a school named after Lamar in most every, every town and city in Texas, he instituted a policy of total extinction or total expulsion of Texas Indians to make the land available to whites. And so it, when Lamar became president, it became illegal, you can use the term, uh, for Indians to exist in Texas. And uh, a lot of people are always asking me, how how was it growing up as an Indian in Texas? And they're not aware that we that there was a policy to kill all the Indians in Texas. So I say, well, I mean, we were illegal at that time, so we all were under underground, and uh, all our ceremonies were illegal, and they would kill Indians if they saw them practicing any of our ceremonies. And at the end of the presentation, I mean, there will be a time for you guys to be asking questions. So be a little patient and then we'll deal with the question. But by 1845, when Texas was annexed to the United States, most remaining indigenous people went underground and passed as Mexicans for the sake of survival. The uh, authorities and the Texas Rangers could not tell the difference between a Mexican and an Indian, and basically because they were the same, so we passed the Mexicans for the sake of survival. A consequence of this was that now Texas does not have any original Texas Indians that have federal recognition. And uh, that has become a big problem for us because one of our main programs is repatriation. That is getting the remains of our people and repairing them again. And uh, we have a problem with the people that have the remains that are called collectors. 
that do not want to give to us and accept us as Indians because the federal government does not say that we are Indian. Okay, uh, a lot of Hoatzakas used to live in the Spring Lake area and there we live now. We believe that we emerge as the people from the sacred springs of this area. We believe our creation story is documented on the White Shaman panel. In uh, the end of presentation, I'm probably going to ask how many of you have ever visited the White Shaman panel or have you even heard about the White Shaman panel? The White Shaman panel is located in the confluence of the Pecos and Rio Grande rivers near Comstock, Texas. And there's a, uh, a drawing of the White Shaman panel and it is about 30 feet in length and 15 feet high. So it's, it's, you know, it's pretty big. And if you ever have a chance, you, uh, you need to take one of the tours to the White Shaman panel. They started them again when I, we started going, it was $8 a person, but they didn't charge us. I don't know how much they're charging for a tour of the White Shaman panel. Okay, the White Shaman panel, we believe that it was created by Cuauhtecans for three main reasons. It is in the Cuauhtecan homeland, so it had to be the local Indians who did it. Because you're not going to travel to another territory to do a panel. And it is about the Cuauhtecan creation story, and it is also about the Cuauhtecan peyote ceremony. We, we see all the elements of our creation story, and we also see all the instructions of our all night peyote ceremony that has become the Native American church. Okay. So if you look at this map of the United States and Mexico, all the area in red is considered to be Cuauhtecan, the Cuauhtecan homeland. You can see that the lower part of Texas is Cuauhtecan homeland and a lot of, large part of the northern part of Mexico is also Cuauhtecan, Cuauhtecan homeland. And one thing about this area, that is the only area in the world where the peyote grows. So everybody now that's part of the Native American church, you know, those uh, Indians in, 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 um, in Canada and in Northern United States and all over the, uh, the United States have come to Texas to, bu to buy the peyote. And even in Mexico, some of them are not starting going to Mexico to do that. Okay, so what is the White Shaman panel about? The uh, panel itself is layered with information. Archaeology today reflects peyotism and remnants of peyote buds have been found older than 5,000 years. There's uh, records, <coughs> excuse me, there's written records that we have been conducting the peyote ceremony for over 10,000 years. We also believe that the, that the panel is an ancient sky map of the cosmos. People in uh, astronomy can, look, can have looked at it and they find a lot of information there. And some of them say that it even gonna predict, predict some events that are gonna happen. It is a map of the geography of the area it records our ceremonial calendar, and it, is our, and it is our creation story and our sacred peyote ceremony. So how do, you read, how do you read the panel? Most books you read on Native Americans will say that we did not have a written language. All the books say that Native Americans did not have a written language. But our ancestors had legitimate writing systems that they used to record our knowledge. We even have, a, a, you know, a lot of books in Mesoamerica, Central America, that were called Code Texas. And we even had libraries 
We had books that were destroyed by the Spaniards when they came. There were only five surviving uh, books that survived because they were hidden, but all the rest were, were intentionally destroyed by the Spaniards to do away with our history, with our culture, and with our ceremonies and our, and our, and our religious beliefs. But there are two other types of uh, writings that have survived, and those are the pictograph and the petroglyphs. So pictographs are painted images, and petroglyphs are carved, packed, or incised images. And the uh, white shaman panel is an example of a pictograph. It is a, it has painted images, and the white shaman panel has five different uh, paints that were used. An interesting thing about the white shaman panel is that it has been carbon dated to be over 4,000 years. And you can still see a lot of the image left, which indicates that they were very advanced with, you know, it, with science, especially chemicals used to, you know, paint on walls. So how do we read the white shaman panel? We were taught to read it in a linear fashion from left to right. When we go to school here in the United States, we are taught to read <coughs> from left to right. But the White Shaman panel, the White Shaman panel was painted the way it was the people that painted it uh, conceive of the universe and of their reality. And it was not one of left to right. So it was, it was painted more in a global fashion in a circular way. And a lot of educators say that a lot of native people, you know, cannot conceptualize because our kids conceptualize circular. And that's what they used to tell me in grad school, that I could not conceptualize, but um, I'm on. We conceptualize both linear, because that's what we thought in, we were taught in school, and we conceptualize circular, because that's the way our, our brain works. So the, the panel has a lot of important information, like it has interpretation of the cosmos, it has the location, basic information, like where's the next water hole. So let's, let's start about our creation story. And we call it, uh, we'll call it Nakapo, which Nakapo means journey. So that pertains to our creation journey. And if you look at the figure on the screen now, there's a, a, in the center of the white shaman panel, there's this white figure, and that's where they, they, the name comes from, the white shaman panel. And if you can see, I don't want to show a pointer now, but I'm going to start talking about some of the elements of the creation story. And if you can see there, we, according to our creation story, there was an upper world and an underworld. And in the panel, you can see a white wavy line going across the panel. So that shows the upper world and the lower world. And then starting to the, to the left of the drawing, you can see that the line goes from white to black and that uh, and I will explain that later but I just wanted to show it to you now okay and some of the figures have several meanings so there are five figures in the panel that represent the spirits of the medicine and we we put the uh, uh, those red arrows to point out those five figures. And there's a, uh, 
on the left, there's a square that shows one of them close up, and that's uh, so the spirits of the animal, of the med the spirits of the medicine were the eagle, the water bird, the wolf, the deer, and the jaguar. And I also have the Quauhtecan name for them. They uh, threw up the Mayacan, the Kampayayue, the Panama, and the Apachuepe. I love saying that word, Apachuepe. Okay, like I mentioned, there's a lot of the figures stand for different things. That also those figures also stand for the <coughs> spirits of creation. Which we have again the eagle, we have a different one, the rabbit, we have another different one, snake, and then we have again the deer and the jaguar. So the panel not only gives you a set of information, but even the same figures and the same icons, you know, stand and for different information and give us a lot of very varied information. Okay, here on the spirits of creation, it also shows the five main senses. You know, the, the eagle is for sight, the rabbit is for taste, the snake for touch, the pamana, the deer is for smell, and uh, the jaguar is for sound. Okay. The white shaman panel figure loses his head that becomes the moon, or the what, what we call in Huahuatecan Anua. And there you see the the figure that is called the white shaman panel, and you can see that it's that it's headless. But when you look at the whole figure, you can see that the head has gone up and become the, has become the moon. So at midnight, the force of the moon pulls on the earth and the earth mother figure, the creative spirit of mother earth, which we call in Quamotecan Tapta'i, to her four elements of fire, water, soil, and air, and with the sacrifice of Grandmother Moon, Anua, we are created in the underworld. All our ceremonies involve the four elements of fire, water, soil, and air. And uh, okay, other elements of the global creation story are the dancers. And there we have a red arrow pointing to a set of three dancers. And, uh, and we believe that that shows that when our people, that our people, according to our creation story, and Maria does a great story about our creation story. She has a, she has a drama background, so she's pretty dramatic telling our story. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit more dry when I talk about our creation story. But anyway, we believe that we were so happy that we had become people, that we started to dance. And, uh, okay, so let's go to the next slide. And, uh, and I'm not gonna go through our whole creation story just a few parts to show here in, in, in the slides and then at the end, so we can have enough time for questions and comments at the end. Another important part of our creation story is that we're going back a little bit to our creation story. According to our creation story, we started as spirits in the underworld. And then when uh, at midnight, when, uh, the force of the moon pull on, on the earth when we became we became human then we started our journey to, to go through the upper world and into this world that we live in now so according to our creation story 
we follow a deer and came out of this world through the springs of water, through some springs of water. And we believe that these are the springs that we call the sacred springs in San Marcos, Texas. And in another slide, I will show you what we believe that we came out at the springs in San Marcos, Texas. <coughs> but if you look at the white shaman panel, you'll see an image of a deer and you'll see a figure on the deer and that's the, you know, shows that we follow the deer up to the upper world and to this world. Okay, here's a figure of a human coming out to the upper world and we call that figure Panama Pilam Ham and it represents human and peyote as one. And you can see that it has antlers and the antlers has small dots that represent the peyote. So Panama Pilam Yam is coming out of the underworld. This represents the life coming in the, of, of the Pilam. So it's called the word for people. And the Pache, the second word for Peyote, we were created together. And Panama Pilam Ham means the, uh, the dear people that we remember. And there it shows that white wavy line turning black. And we use the a use shape altar with a peyote chief in the middle like this image. So that's another that's another instruction to our peyote ceremony. You know, it, it instructs us what kind of altar to use. So it's it's a it's a U shape, and we put the uh, the peyote in the center. Okay, the four. Okay, let me go back to that figure. Okay, again, uh, you see the white line turning black, and that shows it represents the shortest day of the year, or the summer solstice. So that's part of our of our ceremonial calendar. It also has all our the, the dates of the year when we're supposed to do our ceremonies. So that shows us that we need to do a peyote ceremony on the solstice, on the summer solstice. Okay, now getting to the four fountain springs. We have four springs that we consider sacred. <coughs> and they're showing here on the white shaman panel inside that red oval figure. You can see there are four images and they represent the four sacred springs. And if you can, if you look at it, you can see the white line crosses the second of those, the second from the top out of the four fountain springs. And, and, and I'm gonna show you which all four of those represent and which one is the one for San Marcos. And why we believe we, we were created here in the Thinker Springs in San Marcos, Texas. So you see the string coming out from the, from the top down, you see the the white line crossing the second one, showing that's where we came out. And if you superimpose a photograph of the geographical area, and you superimpose it on the on the four on the growing of the four springs, you will see that the four springs coincide pretty much according to the four springs in the in the growing. So, so that's a superimposed photograph on the drawing of the four sacred springs. And the uh, and you can see coming up from, from the top, you see uh, Barton Springs in Austin, then San Marcos Springs, 
in San Marcos, you see the uh, Comal Springs in New Brunswick, and then you see San Pedro Springs in San Antonio. So briefly, that is how we believe that the people were born into Mother Earth and the Sacred Springs in San Marcos. And again, to, to briefly summarize, we believe that the White Shaman Panel was created by Coahuatecans. Number one, because it is in the Coahuatecan homeland, it is about the Coahuatecan creation story, and it is about the Coahuatecan peyote ceremony. <coughs> so, thank you, and Yomanam. And now we can open it up to, uh, to questions. Are there, are you, do you have any comments? Okay. I don't see pictures, I just see names. Anybody have any questions? Okay, we do have some questions from the chat. So um, I'm just gonna go in order here of when I received the questions. And then if anybody else has a question, um, we will get to those. So um, our first one here, question for Dr. Garza. Um, does Texas State University acknowledge um, your people as the indigenous people of San Marcos River and its headwaters? Do they allow ceremony on the property? Yes. Uh, like I, I mentioned at the beginning, we we have we have four sacred water sites and one of the problems when we lost all our land we lost all our sacred sites so but we consider the area in in uh by the sacred springs which is owned by texas state university to be our most sacred site because we believe that's our creation site and uh we started doing ceremony there and we would we would rent the area we would pay texas state 300 dollars to go and pray at our most sacred site but then after a few years uh you know we didn't feel that, we didn't feel that that was right so maria wrote it we we tried to meet with the president but uh, she was too busy to meet with some Indians, but they did approve us to go there and pray without having to pay. So now all we gotta do, we just have to reserve the area and make sure that nobody else is gonna be using it like for a wedding or a boat race or anything. And so now we can go and pray there at their sacred site free. Okay, thank you. Right. Another, and another thing that I wanted to mention about Texas State is that they have the uh, Center for Archaeological Studies, which has or had uh, remains of, of people that were dug up from the area. Let me, let me say this before I, I, I continue that. It has always been against the law to deserve a human grave. However, nationwide, the, they have over 7 million remains of our of native people that they have dug up and have in cardboard boxes, in museums, in universities, in state and federal institutions. So Texas State has two centers that deal with human remains. One is the one that of, of people that die trying to cross the river and all that. So they they take those remains and, and, and try to they do DNA tests and try to identify them and, and connect them to their relatives and give them back to the relatives to, to bury. And, th and these are recent remains. These are not <coughs> ancient archaeological remains. 
Texas State had several ancient archaeological remains, and we have worked with them and through NEPRA and with them, and they have they have given us one set of remains, and then also they reburied another set of remains and allowed us to to do a our own ceremony because we have we are the only tribe the Garza Mejan tribe of Texas, the only tribe that has a repatriation cemetery. We don't like to use the word cemetery, but it's a repatriation cemetery. And, 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 and San Marcos, Texas is the only city in Texas that has their own repatriation cemetery for remains removed from Hayes County. So, to also add to answering your question about Texas State, they do recognize us as indigenous people. They recognize our tribe, and so they have been very uh, cooperative in in helping us rebury our remains. Awesome! Thank you so much for answering that question. Um, yeah. Okay. We have another one which says, for Mexican-American Tejano families who have origins in or have lived in the Kualatecan homeland since before anyone can remember, are there ways to build community, learn about our history, and be in ceremony with other people of Kualatecan descent? Well, yes. The, the general the answer is yes. And the, the 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 way to go about that is if uh, for those people to become part of a Native American community in their area where they live. Because I don't want to give a general a general question of Mexican Americans in Texas because Texas is pretty big. But there are a lot of uh, Mexican Americans, or you know. Hispanics or whatever you want to call them that are learning their history and are finding out that a lot of our people were colonized by the Spaniards and we went through a lot of different labels you know through you know Hispanics and, and Tejanos and this and that and now you know they keep coming up with different labels you know Latinos, Latinx, Chicanx, and all that stuff, but the majority of those people are are, are basically indigenous people. <coughs> and a lot of those people are reclaiming their indigeneity. And so a lot of and one way is to do ceremony. And so those people need to to join some uh, indigenous community in their area. And some of them are doing ceremonies uh, and, and do their ceremonies with, with that group, you know, whether it's uh, peyote ceremonies or sweat lodge ceremonies or naming ceremonies or making relative ceremonies. And there, you know, there's a lot of different ceremonies and also a lot of the different groups, you know, perform them a, a, a different. But I believe that when you do a ceremony with good intentions, in a good way, that it doesn't matter if it's a little bit different than the community, you know, you know, a little bit south of you, a little bit north of you, you know, that it's, it's all good. Did I answer that question? Yes, I think that's excellent. And I also, this might be on the same page, but y'all also have a uh, Sacred Springs powwow every year, correct? Is that right? Yes. Excellent, excellent. Uh, why that looks like my nephew, Israel. <laughs> uh, how are you doing, Mijo? Uh Yeah, we, we, we have been doing a, a uh, powwow ceremony, uh, powwow, 11 years, 10 years, but because of the pandemic last year, last year we were forced to go uh, virtual. 
viral, virtual, virtual. I always say viral, but virtual. And this year, we had to do that because of the pandemic. We also have we also have a a summer camp, and we had to go virtual also with the summer camp. And this year, hopefully, it's going to be the last year that we're going to have to go virtual. So we do we're going to do a powwow. Our summer camp is going to be virtual. Our our powwow is also going to be virtual. Okay, awesome. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully everything will be back to normal by next year. Let's hope. <laughs> hopefully, yeah. Um, all right, let's see here. I'm looking through the questions. We're getting a lot of good ones. Um, this one says, how would we show the federal government we are native to this land and receive federal recognition? Well, the United States government has a, has a process for for groups that believe, well, you know, for in, for indigenous groups to apply for federal recognition, because not all the there's, uh, I think the last number that I read was 575 or 76 tribes are federally recognized. But there's a lot of tribes that are not federally recognized, especially <coughs> those from Texas. And part of the problem for that is because they have seven criteria. And one of the one of the criteria that it's hard for a lot of groups to, to to document is that they existed as a group and had a government since 1990. You know, we're talking about 1900. I'm sorry, not 1990. One nine zero zero, nineteen hundred. So we're talking about a mm, hundred. How, how much is that? Well, anyway. Uh, so th that's pretty hard to document, especially if you were illegal during that time. I mean, you could not, you could not come out in the open. Or publicly that you were an indigenous and, and had a government and then document your activities because they were illegal. I mean, the like all the ceremonies of Native people across the United States were illegal till 1978. I went to Vietnam for two tours and it was illegal for us to do our ceremonies or to pray, you know, before going over there or while being over there. So when it's illegal, when you're illegal, I mean, you're not able to document a lot of your existence, your, you know, or events that, that document your, ex, your existence as a native person. So it's hard to document that you were an Indian since 1900. But the United States has a process for that. Uh, and uh, like even when uh, the Native Americans Grace Protection and Repatriation Act was passed, it was, you know, understood that it was only for federally recognized tribes. But then a lot of, a lot of, non federally recognized tribes like, like us started requesting remains, they make some exceptions. And we have received some uh, remains through NAPRA. There's only 11 non federally recognized tribes that have received remains through NAPRA, and we're one of them. So the United States has a process, but it's not an easy process, and very few. And very few tribes have, have gotten federal recognition to that process. Right now, we have uh, a new Secretary of the Interior, which is over the, the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And uh, hopefully, she'll make some changes in that area, but we don't know. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, I actually just recently saw the news that she had been appointed to the 
uh, Secretary of the Interior. So hopefully there will be some change made, like you said. Um, and she's the first, she's the first, not only the first woman, <coughs> no, she's the second woman, but she's the first Native American person to be Secretary of the Interior, which is the, 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 the department that's over in the, in, in all Native people in the United States. And native and land that used to belong to native people, and that is what that is why there was a lot of opposition to her, because she is against, uh, you know, fracking and 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 really on, on, on native land and and the pipelines and all that stuff. So a lot of this, you know, rich white people that are making money on that were opposed to her and were doing a lot of lobby against her so but she prevailed yes and I'm, I'm very glad that she did i think hopefully it will be a good change and hopefully we'll see some good stuff come out of it um okay let's see we have another question and i'm apologizing in advance for pronunciation um the, the word coquila is an aztec um aztec slash <laughs> Nahuatl word? I'm so sorry for pronunciation. Is the Qualitec in language uh, and culture also Aztec or Nahuatl in origin? And if not, why? Well, okay, the, 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 the second word there you try to pronounce is Nahuatl. Okay, thank you. <laughs> it's, not, it, it, it's not a Nahuatl word. That's, that belongs to a different uh, language family. You know, the, the Qualitecan language comes from a different, there, there's a lot of language families and, uh, and, and they're from different, different language families. Okay, gotcha, excellent. Um, let's see here. Um, okay, I have another question. Um, did the Qualitecans extend to Austin or further north? Um, the first map presented was not zoomed in to see boundaries, um, but the second map did show Barton Springs. So can you expand on the boundaries of the um, group? Well, at one time, we believed that they were, you know, up to, you know, Austin and Barton Springs, but then, but then they started moving south and, um, Yeah, they, they started, see, once the white settlers started moving into, into Austin, into Texas, and then they started the Texas Rangers, you know, the, like I mentioned, the, the, the main reason for the creation of the Texas Rangers was to kill Mexicans and Indians. And, uh, and you know, talking about that, you know, you always hear about, when you hear about uh, what do you call it? What do you call it? Scalp, scalping, that the Indians used, you know, started scalping and they used to scalp people. But the scalping started because there were bounties on Indians. So it was uh, the, the killers of the Indians that started scalping the Indians so they could take all the scalps and collect money. You know, they would collect money for scalps from, you know, adults from men, women, and children. So they even had the scalps from children. And, but then, but that was started, originally it started from the, by the French in, in France. But then the, when, you know, the white people that came here, they started scalping, but somehow it's the Indians who started, who got the, the bad reputation of scalping people. Okay. I forgot the question. What was the question? <laughs> um, it was about the boundaries of the Qualitecan group um, because it said they were saying that um, the second map did show Barton Springs, but they just wanted to know general boundaries. Okay. Well, you, you, you have to remember that the word boundary was not part of our of the way we conceptualize we did not have boundaries the uh and at one time you know people from south america 
we travel all the way to Central and North America and, 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 and vice versa. A lot of the tribes that ended up in, uh, in the United States originated in, in Mexico or, 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 so, or in South America. And we used to move up and down for hundreds, thousands of years. And this is what happened when the United States started putting boundaries or, <coughs> or borders. You know, a lot of these people continued doing what they have been doing for, for centuries. And then they, they made it illegal. They said, okay, you know, you guys are illegal, but I mean, how can a person be illegal? You know, think about that. So to answer your question, we used to move back and forth to a lot of these areas. And then it wasn't when the United States got established and, and boundaries were set that then saying, okay, I mean, these Indians are from Oklahoma, these Indians are from or from Mexico and see, and that's another thing is that even right now, Mexico has more Indian tribes that speak their language, that know their culture than the United States does. That wasn't part of the question, but I thought I'd throw it in anyway. I think that's great, you know what? <laughs> all right let's see we have time for a few more questions let me see if i can get through all of them before we run out of time um okay it says we have a couple people who have asked if you have any recommendations for books or language resources or anything to learn more about uh, this topic well you can go to our website and it's Indigenous with an S, cultures with an S, dot org. And we, we have been planning to start a language program. And we're waiting for a linguistics person to come and help us with that. We, uh, there's an old saying, and I see that most of you have Spanish last names. There's an old saying in Spanish that says, el que nació para tamales, del cielo le caen las hojas. So translated means the person that was made, that was born to make tamales, he's gonna get the, the, the courthouse from heaven. So we're waiting for this linguistic person to come from heaven, or, but it's you know, from Texas. <laughs> so we, and we, uh, should I tell you about the culture center? We're also in the process of trying to establish an indigenous cultural center here in San Marcos and where we're gonna have a lot of culture classes and one of them is gonna be a language class. And, uh, and one thing that I've also thought about was having an online language class. There's one that's on Nawa and it's, I have seen it several times. It's very interesting, and it's called uh, Cafe Konawa. So the the guy who does the, the the show, you know, starts with a cup of coffee. So he says Cafe Konawa. So then he says, you know, the the letter the 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 word for today is so and so, and this is how it's formed, and this is how we use it, and all that stuff. And that's that's a very he's a great instructor. Um, his name is Curly. He goes by Curly. So I guess his hair is Curly, but he's cut real short. But anyway, I mean, he's an interesting character. He's a great instructor. And uh, and I thought, I said, well, maybe having something like uh, chocolate con pobeltecan or something else. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get it going. 
but you know, check out our website, indigenouscultures.org. Excellent. Yes, we uh, put it in the chat too, indigenouscultures.org, if y'all wanna uh, check that out. Um, let's see here. We have time for about one more question. Let's see. And yes, I'm seeing some people asking about um, this presentation. It will be recorded and sent. It's being recorded right now and will be sent out afterwards in case you want to review it. Um, let's see here. Um, Do I get a royalty every time you guys show the. the, the, the I'm kidding. <laughs> Uh, let's see, uh, can you, let's see, can you say more about why the transition from the black line to the white line aligns with the summer solstice? Um, I would think the transition from dark to light might be more closely associated with the winter solstice. Is this a matter of leading or reading right to left rather than left to right? And that's from Carrie. No, it, it doesn't have anything to do with going right to left. Um, it just has to do that that's the shortest day of the year, the shortest day of the year. And, it's, and sometimes I, 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 I'm, I'm very dyslexic and sometimes I confuse my summer with the winter and left to right, but uh, I think it's the summer solstice. That's the shortest day of the year. Yes, that's right. And the, and the uh, talking about the solstice, our Guauteca New Year is the first full moon <coughs> after the spring equinox. That's when we celebrate our Guauteca New Year. That's and that's another day to have ceremony. Very nice. Is that coming up? I know the equinox was pretty recent, so that would be... Yeah, well, one problem is that because of the pandemic, we don't want, you know, we have not been having ceremonies all this last year because the, the last time we had a, a ceremony, we had a get, you know, a, a group of people together was when we re six sets of remains at our cemetery. And that was last March. That was last March. And after that, we have not, gotten together in a group and we don't want to expose a, a lot of our community or older people and uh, which are, I mean, you young people get it and you re recover real easy, but, but people over 65, which I'm already close to hitting 80, you know, we, uh, you know, we don't want to be responsible for any of our elders getting sick and passing before they should. So you know, we're not gonna have, we probably won't have a ceremony till we figure it's safe, which would probably be in 2022. And talking about our, I mentioned a, a Global Declan Cultural Center, we also plan to have a ceremonial area to have for our people to come and have different ceremonies there. That would be great. Yeah, I don't blame you for not wanting to celebrate this year in person. It's a, still pretty dangerous out there. So, okay, well, it looks like we are running out of time, but um, Thank you all so much for joining us. Dr. Garza, Maria, thank you so much for presenting. I really, really appreciate it. This is our largest turnout for River Reflections ever. So yay. <laughs> um, but yes, thank you all so much. And then if you registered, um, we will be getting in contact with you um, with the information. So thank you all so much. Be sure to check out Indigenous Cultures Institute. Um, and just as a reminder, our next River Reflections will be um, April 22nd. It'll be about sustainability and cleaning for Earth Day. Um, so we'll have uh, some good presentations then as well. So feel free well, to- thank you. Thank you for in, in inviting us. And I, I hope I gave you some information that you were looking for and that was helpful to you guys. And, uh, and if, <clears throat> you can, if you guys have any questions or, or comments, 
feel free to send us a, a, an email. You know, to, it should be on our website. Uh, you can send one to, to me in mario.garza at indigenouscultures.org or, or to my wife, maria.rocha at indigenouscultures.org or just to indigenouscultures.org and we will answer your question. Excellent. Yes, thank you so much. All right. And well, I am going to sign off, but thank you once again. I hope everybody enjoyed this presentation. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't know you.